it's not one of the ones that will catch fire, is it? It won't catch fire, we hope. <laughs> so, Lord Stern, thank you so much for agreeing to an interview on my book, A Restored Earth. We've got my paper there. And really, Lord Stern, I wanted to ask you three or four questions, if I may, and I'll give them to you all now so you can reflect on them and then we'll go through them. Please. The first is on the transition that you describe so well in all your work from where we are now in the world to where we need to be, whether it's on renewable energy or on cities or on infrastructure, on land use. And so the question really is how are we going to do this in the time that we have available? And um, could you describe the transition that you envisage and that you've written about so well? The second question is about examples of great things happening around the world, because this book is really an attempt to talk about great things that are being done already in the world on cities and on energy and on land use, etc. I wanted to ask you about India and China, because I know that you know these countries so well, and I thought that it would be important to get your views on those two. I wanted to ask you about the ethics of all of this, because you've written so well about that and your friendship with Amartya Sen and so on, and I thought it would be interesting. And then the final question was really a sort of more of a one about, you know, are you optimistic? How do you view the world, in having done so much on this? And um, it was a sort of more of a general personal question, I suppose. But yes. if we could start on the transition, could you describe how we're going to get from where we are now to where we need to be? The first thing about the transition is the urgency. In the next 20 years or so, we will be building infrastructure, something like one to one and a half times the infrastructure we already have. Yeah. The main reason for that is the very rapid pace of urbanisation. In the next 35 or 40 years, as cities will go from around 3.5 billion to about 6.5 billion people, 50% of the world's population now, to more like 70% of the population four decades from now. And those cities layout, structures, infrastructure will be largely set in the next 20 years, the first two of those four decades. So if you look at the sheer quantity of infrastructure in relation to the decisive couple of decades for our cities, you see that these next two decades will really settle whether we have much chance of holding to two degrees or even we hope, well below two degrees as agreed in Paris, and whether we can have cities where we can move and breathe and be productive. So the first thing about the transition is a criticality of the next 20 years mm -hmm. and the scale, as I've just described. Mm -hmm. So if you think of the scale and the urgency, that shapes an awful lot of the how. It means that we have to look for infrastructure which um, is pretty well sustainable from now on mm -hmm. across the board. Mm -hmm. The efficiency of the use of resources will be extremely important and we have to think of our forests and our land. Mm -hmm. So those are the areas in the to-do list uh, in relation to the scale and the urgency. Mm -hmm. um, but we also, of course, have to think of the the policies and the institutions that could deliver. I think it means that cities have to take a strong lead in shaping themselves mm -hmm. and that we have to, as nations, empower cities and as citizens of the world who are working on these issues, including the multilateral development banks, uh, help cities to pursue um, the kinds of strategies which just would make them so much more attractive and better functioning as mm. cities, as mm. I said, without the congestion and pollution that cripples them now. Um, and of course, that will make them much more productive as well as much more attractive. So I think uh, that would be one way. Policies, of course, part regulation, part pricing, mm -hmm. which means uh, that we should value the air, which means you should have to pay for polluting it. Mm -hmm. That's pollution, price mm -hmm. of carbon. Of course, burning fossil fuels both gives you air pollution and mm. uh, releases greenhouse gases. Uh, some part of that is likely to be regulation. Sometimes regulation brings clarity mm -hmm. and allows people to move more quickly and on scale. For example, no fossil fuel powered cars in city centres after some date, mm -hmm. 2020, 2025, whatever it might be. That's the kind of regulatory approach which should have a very dramatic uh, effect. 
investing very strongly in our uh, forests and grasslands mm -hmm. because they're so important, of course, to our ecosystems, which uh, give us so much in terms of um, water and weather and, mm. and uh, species and, mm. and so on. Mm. Um, and there, for example, a much stronger role for indigenous people mm. and land rights for indigenous people mm. could affect outcomes in a very uh, big way. Mm investing a lot in restoring grasslands mm. and restoring eroded land is also something that's very productive agriculturally mm. and very good for our ecosystems and uh, to capture carbon. Mm -hmm. So those are obviously, you. you know, one could take a long time yes. on that, but those are some, clear. some areas. Thank you very much. And on fossil fuels to renewable energy, and how do we make that transition? In um, well, part of it is the pricing story. Mm. Um, mm. Part of it as I've just uh, mm. described. Mm -hmm. Part of it is support for innovation. Yeah. Innovation is potentially moving so fast, it is moving fast, but it potentially could move much faster. Mm. And uh, strong resources, public resources and mm. private resources, both behind innovation would be uh, extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Very good. I wanted to ask, therefore, in light of that... Oh, well, I should add, of course, Sorry. to all this, we have mm. to think about finance. Mm. Uh, the fossil fuels are becoming riskier and riskier. Mm. Mm. And uh, new technologies, renewable technologies, are coming down and down in cost. Mm. But we've got to have financial structures which recognise that risk and show the risk that is in the fossil fuels and reduce the risk for the new technologies. Mm -hmm. That way you not only create the projects which can arise from the policies, but you also bring forward at the same time the finance. Yeah. And once you've got over the risky stages in your innovations and your infrastructure, then there's tremendous potential for private finance on a very big scale. Mm -hmm. But you need to get through the risky stages and that's mm -hmm. why development banks and, thing, and things like that are, are potentially so important. Thank you, Nick. I wanted to ask you about a couple of examples around the world in any of these areas where you feel countries or communities or cities are leading by example. Obviously there are many, but are there anything particularly in your mind? Well, I, if you take Bogota and Barcelona, mm. I mean, Bogota, yeah. you've got um, their rapid uh, bus transport mm -hmm. system. Essentially, if you think of a tram or an underground railway, metro, mm. metro um, they work by having unique access to the track, mm, mm. the trams overground and the underground railway underground. But it's unique access to the track. Mm -hmm. Well, you can create that mm. fairly cheaply mm. and run buses along it. Mm. You can manage, if you are going to have intersections, you can manage those now through new technology mm. uh, and engineering much better than you could before. And Bogota is mm. an example of the rapid rapid bus yes. transport system, almost like an underground railway with a fairly continuous flow of buses. Yeah. And all you have to do is protect the route. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And it's much example. cheaper to protect an overground mm. route than to build mm. an, underground. <laughs> an underground. So that's an example. And Barcelona has managed to become really in many ways the most attractive and efficient least polluting cities mm. in the world mm. by layout, good management. Mm. Uh, you know, it has something like a tenth of the emissions from transport mm. that Atlanta has. And it's a, it's a city of roughly the same population and income per capita. Mm -hmm. So those are two examples of cities. I think Paris is moving strongly mm. in that direction under Mayor and uh, Hidalgo. Hidalgo. Yeah. So I think you can look at the cities. I think um, on deforestation, Brazil actually has mm. had long periods of mm. some success mm. with careful observation and data from mm. satellites, mm. but also you know, rights to indigenous people, mm. giving them the rights to look after the land. That's probably the cheapest and indeed the most just way mm. of um, preserving, preserving forests. So mm. I think there's some good examples of that mm. in uh, in Brazil. Good examples of support for that from Norway yes, as, a, as, a, as a country and indeed good examples from um, 
His Royal Highness Prince Charles in bringing people together around these uh, very good ideas, as you know better than uh, Thank you, anybody. Time. So yeah, there, there are dif fun. different yeah. strands, but there are strong examples. Solar is quite extraordinary. You know, we published mm. the Stern Review ten years ago mm. for the economics of climate change. The price of a solar panel is one tenth now of what it yeah. was then. Quite remarkable. Wind has, has gone dramatically down in cost uh, as well. And very importantly, storage is moving very quickly. Um, you know, Tesla, for example, is uh, a very important uh, example. Uh, Unilever is another very important example of a, of a, 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 a sort of wholesale, re wholesale retail company that's looked very carefully at its uh, supply chain and mm -hmm. its uh, footprint uh, has led the way in refusing to uh, buy palm oil unless it comes from a sustainable chain mm. of production and so on. Yeah. So there yeah, are quite a lot of good examples, uh, good examples out there. The LED, li the LED light bulb, I mean, 10 years ago, who would have thought you could have uh, light bulbs are hardly using electricity at all? You know? yeah. Just extraordinary. Amazing. And it comes from focus. It comes from focus, it comes from regulation, good policies, it comes from uh, investment in innovation. Yes. So quite a lot of good examples. I would say also, China itself, mm. Ten years ago, if you asked me, would China be so focused on uh, energy efficiency, air pollution and uh, greenhouse gas emissions, I would not have predicted. Mm -hmm. China's coal peaked about two years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah? now, it's still got a job to get it coming down, but it's uh, on the way down. On the way down. So, uh, the way China has changed, I think, has in some ways been the most important example of all, simply on in terms of scale. Yes. yes, and you've been going to China now for? Since uh, nearly 30 years. 30 years, and India longer, 40. More than 40. More than 40. Yes. And could you talk to me about India as well, in light of your situation? Well, India is uh, changing. There's still a feeling in India that the rich countries got rich on high carbon growth, and mm. are they trying to put a block on India's growth just when India's getting going? Mm. And there is that feeling in India. Uh, not, not, unique, not uniquely to India, but it has been strong in India. And I think many, many more people in India are now seeing that actually the cleaner way of growing is the stronger way of growing, both in terms of growth rates and in terms of inclusion. You know, decentralised solar is a very inclusive uh, story and, and in terms of resilience. Mm -hmm. That argument is not won in India, but it's moved mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. moving. So India is talking about uh, smart cities. It's mm. talking much more about sustainability. You know, solar in Rajasthan is probably competitive with coal now, even without appropriate pricing right. for uh, carbon and uh, pollution uh, through in, involved in coal. So it really is changing. But that worry that will this slow our growth is still there, and the answer to that is no, it won't. It mm. should actually enormous opportunity to accelerate growth mm. as we set out in Better Growth, Better Climate, which was published in September 2014 mm -hmm. by the Global Commission on Economy and Climate, or the New Climate Economy. Mm. So I do think India is uh, changing. I worry very much about India's cities. Mm. They are growing particularly rapidly and they're particularly polluted. Mm. Mm. Uh, out of the top or bottom, which is where you look at it, most polluted cities in the world, I think 13 are mm. in India. Mm. You should check that, and Delhi's mm. the worst. Mm. Mm. I think there is no Chinese city in, the, okay. in that group of 25. No. Okay. Whereas people always think of China first. Mm -hmm. So this is a very serious issue. Very serious issue. Yeah. But that is actually change, starting to change things in India as it did in China. Yes. As it did in China. So that has become very much part of the uh, story. China, as I've already mentioned, in the 12th and 13th five-year plans, the 13th five-year plan started a year or so ago, they uh, are very strong on energy efficiency and on reducing emissions. And they do guide uh, much of what happens, they become law. So you really are seeing China change. And China sees itself as vulnerable to the air pollution, 
vulnerable to the water effects of climate change, which of course the main effects of climate change mm. are through water. Mm. And water has been a big issue in China for millennia. Mm. Mm. And uh, they're very worried that the main rivers, main flows of water are changing. Mm. Mm. So they are worried. Uh, and of course they see the opportunities. In, they'd rather like to win the green race. And <laughs> good, good luck to them. Good luck, good luck to anybody who's competing <laughs> in, the, in the green race. Thank you, Nick. I wanted to ask you about the, the ethics of all of this and in context of your friendship with Marty Sen, whom we all admire so much, and how to ensure that everybody wins effectively from the actions that you're describing and how to ensure that equity is at the heart of this approach that we adopt and noting in particular the two billion in the world who currently don't have access to energy and I wanted to draw you out a bit on that. Yeah, the, there's equity within populations and there's equity across time. Mm. Um, we have an obligation, many of us would argue, including Amartya and Prince Charles and myself, mm. we have an obligation to offer future generations the opportunities which we had. Mm. Mm. Now, they may be transformed in some way or other, and that's because things change, but to offer them living standards and opportunities of the kind we had, uh, and so that they can offer their children, next generation, similar opportunities. And many of us would argue that this is a question of equal opportunity of equity across generations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that I think is a very important principle and it, it takes us to sustainability. It, it is really the, an articulation of what sustainability means from the point of view of ethics and uh, action. There's also um, equity within populations and it's the poorest people who hit um, most severely and earliest uh, by climate change, by severe weather events and you know, if you look at people who die as a result of storms, typhoons, hurricanes, it's usually the poorest people mm. in those uh, mm. populations. So protecting from climate change, managing climate change responsibly is very much about equity. At the same time there is uh, opportunity and productivity and there uh, uh, many of the newer technologies like decentralized solar offer real opportunity to uh, poorer people uh, they offer children the chance to study at night mm -hmm. they release from dependency either on burning uh, wood or fossil fuels or kerosene, all the things that damage health so badly, um, or if they have some chance of access to the grid, often that's very unreliable mm. and actually mm. a, often a tool of corruption because people have their hands on your mm. switches as it mm. were. Mm. So they are very empowering, these decentralized forms of energy. They, you know, Women don't have to go so far to collect firewood and so they're safer kids have a chance to study. Often it's the women who look after the charging apparatus um, mm -hmm. coming from uh, solar panels. So those are examples of ways in which people can get a, a real chance to have access to energy, but in a way that's <coughs> more healthy and more reliable, mm -hmm. uh, as well as being uh, resilient uh, uh, or helping our overall resilience against uh, climate change. So I think you have to look at equity in that way, the rights of future generations, that we should treat them. We shouldn't discriminate by date of birth, give people the same mm. opportunity. I think we should also have a, a special uh, emphasis in our policies on delivery for poorer people. Mm. And that includes not making future generations much poorer than, mm. uh, than uh, we are, but also within populations, uh, having a strong emphasis and priority. Uh, for the uh, one to two billion people who don't have access to mm. to, uh, to power. Thank you, Nick. My last question was about optimism in a sense and, and your your view. I mean, you've had such an important year. You were there at the time in Paris Agreement. We've now ratified the agreement earlier than we thought possible. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And here you are, you've been plugging away at this for the last X years, 15 years, however long it's been, or much longer in your career, but over the last, since the Stern Review. And I wondered your assessment on, on, the, on whether you think we're moving fast enough and what more could be done. 
uh, since the la over the last 10 years, if we just take since the Stern Review, I've become more worried about the effects of climate change. Now, the, the science and the speed of change both indicate that the potential consequences are even more worrying than the very worrying position that we saw 10 years ago. We've been slow. You know, over the last 10 years, emissions have gone up, not uh, down. And uh, that period of development of science and slowness of movement are more worrying. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the technology has changed quite remarkably, faster than I think, certainly faster than we anticipated 10 years ago. And we see so much more coming down the track mm -hmm. in terms of renewables, in terms of city design, and the role of digital terms of materials and so on that can do things very differently, including storage and insulation and so on. It's a tremendous technical progress of a good kind. Um, and we see some quite promising moves in political will. I mean, Paris, of course, and its uh, adoption in December last year, and it's um, coming into force in November this year after 11 months. It's quite a remarkable mm. expression of that political will. But that political will is patchy, and it's not moving fast enough. So I'm extremely optimistic now about, we, about what we can do. We're mm -hmm. starting to see in terms of technologies, cities, policies, and so on, um, and in, including in, uh, in uh, our forests and grasslands. We're starting to see a very promising way what can be done. Mm -hmm. But uh, are we moving fast enough? Absolutely no, not yet. Mm. Could we move much faster? Yes. And that's really what we've been discussing mm. for the last half mm. an hour. So the whole process of strengthening that political will and action is absolutely key. So very optimistic about what we can do, mm. um, less optimistic about what we will do, but then our job is to turn the optimism of the possible Mm. into the optimism of the feasible and uh, that's our task and that's what I hope your book will be about. Thank you very much Lord Stern, that is my hope too and I'm very grateful to you for the time and for your inspiring leadership in this whole area which has been made such a huge difference so thank you. A real pleasure talking to you Edward. Thank you. Good, Thanks good. so much. Excellent, hope we covered that. Thank you so we did. Thank